Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, and we'll start with uh, verses 6 through 8. Our topic tonight is the beginning of sorrows. This is the third in our discussion of the Olivet Discourse, and we are looking at a passage that is referred to a lot in our day and age by, by Christians thinking that they see the end of time coming, but I ask you the question, is that really what Jesus is talking about here? So let's look at the scripture. Verse 6 says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So, as I just said, it's not uncommon to hear Christians saying that we are living in the end times. World news is full of wars and rumors of wars. And Christians will often mention Matthew 24, verse 6, when talking about these wars as if this passage predicts such things. We also hear in the news about famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. And we assure ourselves that verse 7 predicts these things. But in these three verses, Jesus is not making predict predictions about our times or the time just before his second coming. Wars and rumors of wars. Pestilence, famines, and earthquakes have been with us for the past 2,000 years. This is nothing new. Jesus tells us that these things must come to pass, but they do not signify the end. Matthew and Mark write, but the end is not yet. Luke has it, but the end will not come immediately. Jesus said that. I'm talking about wars and rumors of wars and pestilences and famines and earthquakes. It says, this isn't the end. It will not come immediately. So Matthew and Mark report Jesus saying, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. So, of what time is Jesus speaking that will be concerned with wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, and so forth. Luke says in chapter 20, verse 1, verse 12, but before these things, well, what things? Well, the wars and rumors of wars and so forth. But before these things, they will lay up their hands, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you. Jesus here on Mount Olives is prophesying of the destruction of Jerusalem beginning in verses 15 of Matthew chapter 24. So the wars and rumors of wars and so forth are things that take place between the beginning of the persecution of the church and the destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus said before these things, these wars, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. He's talking about the persecution of the church. So before wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and earthquakes, there's going to begin a persecution of the church. The per persecution of the church began shortly after the day of Pentecost with the death of Stephen. In Acts chapter 8 verse 1, we read, Now Saul was consenting to his death. That means the death of Stephen. At that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So we see that the martyrdom of Stephen began the persecution of the church. Stephen was martyred approximately 36 AD, shortly after the day of Pentecost. The things of which Jesus speaks of in verses 6 through 8 of his discourse take place in the 34 year period between the beginning of the persecution of the church and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. 
something you may want to make a note there, that all of this that he's talking about in these few verses take place in a 34-year period between the death of Stephen and the destruction of Jerusalem. So, I ask you, were there wars and rumors of wars? Were there famines, pestilences, and earthquakes during these 34 years? Well, you can already guess the answer. It's got to be yes, right? The silly grin on my face tells you so. Well, Albert Barnes comments on these events in his notes on the New Testament. Where Jesus says, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. <clears throat> At Caesarea, the Jews and Syrians contended about the right to the city, and 20,000 of the Jews were slain. At this blow, the whole nation of the Jews was exasperated and carried war and desolation through the Syrian cities and villages. Sedition and civil war spread throughout Judea. Italy was also thrown into civil war by the contest between Otho and Vitellius for the crown. So just looking at history, you can look at this time as a time of wars and rumors of wars. If you, you know, have done any studying of, of Judea and Palestine in, in those years between uh, the death of Christ and the destruction of Jerusalem, it was a difficult and hard time filled with wars and carrying on. And there shall be famines. There was a famine foretold by Agabus in Acts 11:28 which is mentioned as having occurred by Tacitus, Suetonius, and Eusebius, and which was so severe in Jerusalem, Josephus says that many people perished for want of food. Four times in the reign of Claudius, famine prevailed in Rome, Palestine, and Greece. And those that have been the years 41 through 54 AD. So there was definitely seasons of famine during this time period. What about pestilences? Jesus said there would be pestilences. Raging epidemic diseases. The plague sweeping off multitudes of people at once. It is commonly the attendant of famine and often produced by it. A pestilence is recorded as raging in Babylonia AD 40. In Italy A.D. 66. Both of these took place before the destruction of Jerusalem. Still quoting from Dr. Barnes. Well, what about earthquakes? Glad you asked. Dr. Barnes writes, in prophetic language, earthquakes sometimes mean political commotions. Literally, they are tremors or shakings of the earth, and often shaking cities and towns to ruin. The earth opens and houses and people sink indiscriminately to destruction. Many of these are mentioned as preceding the destruction of Jerusalem. Tacitus mentions one in the reign of Claudius at Rome and says that in the reign of Nero, the cities of, listen, Laodicea, Hierapolis, and Colossae were overthrown and the celebrated Pompeii was overwhelmed and almost destroyed by an earthquake. Others are mentioned as occurring at Smyrna, Miletus, Chaos, and Samos. So there were a lot of earthquakes happening in that part of the world during this 34-year period of time. Now in addition to these things, Luke adds in his writing and there will be fearful signs and great signs from heaven. Matthew and Mark don't mention this, but Luke does. <clears throat> Again, these signs are in advance of the fall of Jerusalem. The ancient historian, Jewish historian Josephus, made a record of some of the strange happenings that took place in Jerusalem during that time. And they were strange happenings. Barnes again relates some of these strange things for us as he quotes from Josephus. 
Josephus, who probably never heard of this prophecy, and who certainly would have done nothing designedly to show its fulfillment, records the prodigies and signs which he says preceded the destruction of the city, meaning the city of Jerusalem. A star, says he, resembling a sword, stood over the city, and a comet that continued a whole year. At the Feast of Unleavened Bread, during the night, a bright light shone round the altar and the temple, so that it seemed to be bright day for half an hour. The eastern gate of the temple, of solid brass, fastened with strong bolts and bars, and which had been shut with difficulty by twenty men, opened in the night of its own accord. A few days after that feast, he says, before sunsetting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding the cities. Great noise, as of the sound of a multitude, was heard in the temple, saying, Let us remove hence. Four years before the war began, Jesus, the son of Artanus, a plebeian and a husbandman, came to the Feast of the Tabernacles, when the city was in peace and prosperity, and began to cry aloud, A voice from the east, a voice from the east, a voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and the holy house, a voice against the bridegroom and the brides, and a voice against the whole people. He was scourged, and in every stroke of the whip he cried, Woe, woe to Jerusalem! This cry, he says, was continued every day for more than seven years, till he was killed in the siege of the city, exclaiming, Woe, woe to myself also! Luke said there would be some really strange things, some fearful signs and great signs from heaven. These things You've got to believe Josephus. He would have no reason to make this kind of stuff up. Josephus was there during the siege of Jerusalem. You realize that. He was a general in, in the Jewish army fighting against the Romans. And he observed these events that happened at this time. The comet, the star that was shaped like a sword, the appearance of an army up there in the clouds going on, the light shining in the temple, and the strange cry, let us remove hence. Spooky. But these things actually happen. And as Barnes points out, Josephus probably never heard of Jesus' prophecy, had no reason to try to uh, describe its fulfillment in any way. What he wrote, we believe, is historically accurate. These things happened. And Jesus said these things would happen. In verses 9 through 14 of Matthew's account, Jesus tells his disciples of more things, all of which are recorded as happening in the book of Acts. You have to understand that in these few verses, Jesus is giving us a preview of the book of Acts. This is what's going to happen to the church between now and the fall of Jerusalem. So what were some of those things? Well, there was more tribulation and persecution. There were betrayals by false brethren. There were more false prophets. Lawlessness and the love of many growing old. People often make reference to what Jesus says here as proof that we are reaching the end of our time, the end of time in our days. However, these things are not new to our days. They have existed for the past 2,000 years of the church. And they will continue to exist up to the very day Jesus does return. Jesus gave his disciples some good counsel in Luke chapter 21, verse 19. And it is still good counsel for us in our time. 
He says, by your patience, possess your souls. By your patience, possess your souls. The Amplified Bible has it, by your steadfastness and patient endurance, you shall win the true life of your souls. What is Jesus telling the disciples? And what is he telling us? He's saying, do not be distracted by events. Do not be distracted by events or the importance that false prophets may place on these events. Because you see, events will happen. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be pestilences. There will be famines. There will be earthquakes. And strange things will happen. So do not be distracted by them. Jesus is telling us, stay true to the gospel of salvation that Christ brought. Live a holy life and be sure that you make heaven in the end. Do not be distracted. I saw in the newspaper where there's some prophet coming to town to uh, bring prophetic lectures at one of our local churches. I'm sure he'll attract a crowd. However, it's going to be a crowd looking for something different than what we're talking about here. When we discuss prophecy here, it's too plain, it's too simple, it's too historic. It's not fascinating. It doesn't distract people. Okay? The news is full of terror. It's full of wars, full of plagues and all sorts of things. And whenever something happens in the Middle East, hordes of prophecy teachers jump on the bandwagon almost with delight in spreading waves of fear and doom. They couch it all in millennial terms and in a manner as to imply they have a special gift of prophecy from God. It's like they're saying, listen to me. I'm the one who has figured this out. Say, I've written this book. I'm giving these lectures. I have this PowerPoint presentation. I'm on the television telling you and then they add that they need you to send them money so they can continue this Holy Ghost ministry and spread the word of warning. It really makes you wonder what they are after if you sit there and listen to what they have to say. That people will tune these guys in and they'll eat up this teaching like it was cookies and milk, ice cream and cake. They're fascinated by prophetic teaching. And boy, just, you know, let something happen in the Middle East. Somebody's got an answer for it. They found an obscure scripture somewhere in one of the prophecies, and this is exactly what they're prophesying about. And they've written this book, and they've got the answer for you. But Jesus said, Beware of false prophets. Jesus said, By your patience, Possess your souls. We need to listen to what Jesus said. And it's good for us to study Bible prophecy and to debunk the deception that is going on around us. I know when you dig into the prophecies of Daniel and you realize, oh my goodness, this is ancient history. It's about this king and this country and this date and this date and this date. Your just eyes begin to glaze over. But at least you know it's history. It's history that God foresaw. God predicted and it came to pass. And we can look back and we can say, my, what a wonderful God thing God did by revealing that. We look at the teaching of Jesus here. Again, people like to mystify it and project it all out into the future the rapture and the millennium and uh, the battle of Armageddon and things like that. And when you dig into it, you realize Jesus is talking about what's immediately going to happen after he leaves. He's talking in this about this 34 year period between the beginning of the persecution of the church and the destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus said, 
the persecutions and the wars and rumors of war are only the beginnings of sorrows. He ends his remarks in Matthew at verse 14 with a statement of what will actually be the last sign before the end comes. Now, uh, you chose my words very carefully there. The statement of what will actually be the last sign before the end comes. Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Yeah, see, Jesus is talking about the end of time. You see, this statement is often taken out of context and put into the context as being the end of the world rather than the end of Jerusalem. After his resurrection, Jesus commanded the church to do what? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, verse 15. We call that the Great Commission. This has been the missionary cry throughout the church age, and we have heard it loudly proclaimed in our lifetimes. There's one organization that I have extreme regard for, and that is the Wycliffe Bible Translators. They take this command most seriously, and they have translated the Bible or portions of the Bible into all but very few languages and dialects. There is not a people on the face of the earth that cannot have God's Word in a language they can understand. I remember uh, thinking about being part of that organization uh, when I got out of the Army. I was seriously thinking about translation work because I admired their commitment to go into places that most Americans don't want to go. The jungles of Borneo, jungles of South uh, America, Africa, Siberia, places where people just don't want to go. For the sole purpose of translating God's Word into the language of these people. People that have never heard a salvation message. People that have never seen a Bible in their language. You have to admire their commitment and thank God for the work that they have done because there are people today that are saved and have gone to heaven because they have had God's Word in their language. What have you done to reach people in Lawton? Do you realize most people in Lawton speak English? They do. And we have lots of Bibles written in English. We have stacks of Bible here in our church building that we could just give away to people. But you know, Americans just seem to be unconcerned. Look how many people are not here. Look who don't show up Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday. And they have the scriptures. Many of them have Bibles sitting in their home. Some of them have these beautiful Bible sitting on their coffee table. They never read it. That Bible is fortunate if it gets dusted off every once in a while. It's just a decoration. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Our world is rapidly approaching a condition where the gospel is being rejected and missionaries are no longer able to work in foreign lands. While mission work still is being done, the days of free access to unchurched lands may be past. Are we in fact approaching the end? I would certainly agree that if we can't preach the gospel anywhere in the world, God will call an end of time. There's no more need for time. But the end of which Jesus was speaking in the discourse is not the end of the world. It is the end of Jerusalem. So, 
when was this prophecy of preaching the gospel to all the world, the world fulfilled so that the end did come? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. It makes sense to ask that question. If Jesus is talking about the end of Jerusalem, and he said that this gospel has to be preached, then there should be some record that it was preached to every nation before the end of Jerusalem. Well, the day of Pentecost. Remember that? Acts chapter 2, verse 5. It says, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. Do you remember who got up and preached that day? Well, first of all, when the Holy Spirit descended upon the 120, they testified in the various languages of the people that were there so that they could understand. They heard the wonderful, marvelous things of God. And then the Apostle Peter got up and preached. And his sermon is recorded for us in the second chapter of the book of Acts. There were Jews there from every nation under heaven. And thank God the Apostle Peter preached the gospel to people from every nation under heaven. The book of Acts records the growth of the church and the spread of the gospel far beyond Judea all the way to Rome. From Judea, the gospel went north into Asia Minor and then to southern Europe. And we know that it went all the way out to, to Rome. Paul speaks of going to Italy to preach the gospel. We know the history of those times. Some of the apostles went into Egypt and some went east to India and in that part of the world, all preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So we have the historic record that even before the fall of Jerusalem, the gospel had been preached in the known world. In Acts chapter 17, verse 6, we read that in Thessalonica, the charge was made against the church. These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. What a testimony. What a testimony. These who have done what? Turned the world upside down. How did they turn the world upside down? Through the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. And they said they've come here too. Church, we've got a lot of work to do. And there are so few of us to do it. We need the anointing of God's Spirit. Just as the church needed the anointing of the Spirit of God there on the day of Pentecost. We need our own day of Pentecost here in Lawton. So that as the Spirit comes upon us, we can speak. And people will hear the great things of God. That they will hear the messages that are being preached. And that they, their hearts will be turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. The things of which Jesus speaks in verses 6 through 14 in Matthew chapter 24 are certainly evident in our time. And it is not unusual that they should be. But let us keep them in the context of the Olivet Discourse and understand that the end of which Jesus speaks is not the end of time, but the end of Jerusalem. The things he mentions are merely the beginning of sorrows. Sorrows not just for the disciples and the church and the persecution that were coming upon them, but the beginning of sorrows that were the great calamity that soon would fall on Jerusalem and Judea and put an end to the historic people, the Israelites, the people of God. Amen.